to A and B that I gave you tonight and probably go through uh, to 28 if we get that far. I don't want us to miss any of this. I mean, this is a, this is a lesson that you could take weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks on. We're going to try and cover it tonight because we only have eight weeks left and all these other feast days <laughs> and the tabernacle. And I hope to do the tabernacle, not this week. See, next week we'll do uh, the Feast of Pentecost. And then the following week we'll do the tabernacle. Because they received the uh, directions for the tabernacle at the same time they received the law. And they received the law on the same mountain that Abraham, well, actually the same mountain that Moses uh, saw the burning bush, the same mountain uh, where, well, that's a little further. Let's not get into the tabernacles. Let's go back where we were. Because <laughs> I get started on that and I'll just go on and on and on. Like I said, tonight is the Happy New Year for Israel. At 6 o'clock started their Feast of Trumpets. And they also believe that this is the time that the uh, bridegroom married the Messianic Jews, the ones who are saved believes that this is the, the night on which the bridegroom will marry the, the, the bride. And I just thought that was kind of neat. So this is the Feast of the Trumpets, and I know they're having several revivals around. I just hope that last soul will get saved more out of here. Yes. <laughs> because, but if not, there's work to be done. There's souls to be saved and people to be discipled. I want you to look here on page 22A, because I want to do a summary of this, and I'm going to be doing this all through the next few weeks, different summaries, because we don't want to miss this, the chronological, the, the prophetic, I mean, there's just so much in it that I don't want to miss some of the main things, so when I, when I start praying about it, and the Lord says, well, let's just do it in a summary, and then move on to the next one. So let's look at this summary, the summary of Passover and Unleavened Bread, which is the death and the burial. Next week, Lord Will will do the resurrection and uh, Pentecost. But this is the death and burial of Jesus Christ. And Passover was eaten uh, after the evening sacrifice. Remember, there were five sacrifices a day. Now, not when they were in Egypt. When they were in Egypt, they were worshiping idols. In fact, the five sacrifices a day they did sometimes in the wilderness when they could. But really, it was something that they started doing when they were, uh, when they had their temple, because God appointed the temple as the only place they could do sacrifices. That would be the one and only place. That's why they have a shank bone for their Passover meals instead of a lamb. Those who are very traditional, the Orthodox, they won't have a lamb. They have a shank bone because they cannot sacrifice the lamb because they do not have their temple. And it's the only place that they believe that God will receive their sacrifice. So that's why it's so important to them to build their temple. And how sad it is that they're going to build a temple. But the temple they're going to build is the Antichrist temple. And that will be the next one that's built. And they're pushing so hard for the two-state uh, that they're even saying they can actually build the temple beside the mosque. So it's, it's coming so close, and they're trying to uh, get Israel to compromise. I don't know if you saw, and this is tomorrow night's lesson, I don't know if you saw the speech at the UN and how Islam was praised so highly, and Israel was slapped in the face. And we need to understand that all that Arab uh, coalition that they have formed, Every one of them hates Israel wants Israel destroyed. Now, what good they do, all right. But the fact is, is that they're, we're sleeping with the enemy. <laughs> okay? And that plays into the part where the Bible teaches that all nations turn against Israel. The anti-Semitism is growing bigger and bigger and bigger, and that is a sign that Jesus is coming, because he said, before he comes, all nations turn against Israel. And we're watching it come together. When you start making deals with the enemies of Israel, God says you don't make a covenant with the enemies of God. And when you start doing that, <laughs> it, it's going to bring 
it's actually going to bring punishment down upon America. I hate to say that because it seems so, oh no, more. But truth be that it's going to. Because God said, I will bless them who bless you, Israel, and I will curse them who curse you. So we're watching it come to pass so very, very quickly, but we need to look at it from a biblical perspective because the world is looking at it like, wow, look, they've joined all these Arab nations. Wow, look, they're trying to join the Sunnis and the Shiites. Wow, how marvelous. This has never happened before. That's the world's view. And then the world view will be this. Well, the whole problem is not the Sunni and the Shiite. The whole problem is Israel. Mm -hmm. So the Hamas and the Abbas are joining together. The Sunni and the Shiites are trying, they're trying to get them to join together. And the world is going, oh, now we can have that new world order. And I don't know if you've heard the word that was used at the UN today, the globalization of the world. Mm -hmm where the United States of America will just be another little fish in the pond. Do you see that sky? How beautiful that is. I didn't mean mm -hmm. to do that, but wow! <laughs> it just <laughs> all appeared there in the window. How beautiful that is. We can see all these things come to pass. We know how soon the coming of the Lord will be. And we see this in the feast days, as we'll see as we go through these notes tonight. So Passover was eaten. Uh, after the evening sacrifice on the 15th. It was sacrificed between 3 and 6. Christ had to be in the tomb. Okay, At 3 o'clock he died. <coughs> he had to be in the tomb by 6 o'clock because 6 o'clock started the next day. And he could not be left upon the tree. So Passover was eaten after the evening sacrifice on the 15th. The, and the 15th began when? Six o'clock on the 14th. <laughs> That's right. It began six o'clock on the 14th. Exodus 12, 19 says this, Seven days shall there be no leaven found in your house. For whosoever eateth that which is leavened, even that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he be a stranger or born in the land. What does leaven represent? Sin. Sin. That's right. It represents sin. So they were to take a week before Passover and remove all the leaven out of the house. And last week we showed you what they would do the game with the kids. It was very important, even to this day. The Orthodox Jews do that. They remove all the leaven out of their house seven days before Passover because Passover night begins the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And unleavened bread meant putting away of sin. And for seven days, which means complete perfection, as we'll look at these notes. What that was was Jesus being buried. The very night on the 15th, it tells us the Egyptians were burying their first dead. On that very night, Jesus was buried, God's first son. On that very night. So you can see the, the pattern that's absolutely perfect all the way through. So if it, if it follows the pattern halfway, being God, wouldn't it follow the pattern all the way? Absolutely. So leaven is a symbol of sin, and Passover was a memorial to God delivering them from sin, from bondage, from slavery to the world. The Egypt was the type of the world, the taskmasters was the type of sin, Pharaoh was a type of Satan. He was giving us a complete picture of the deliverance of God's children. It was a time of, and still is, a time of self-examination. You know, Jesus took Passover uh, meal with the unleavened bread the night before he was crucified. Because he was crucified at 3 o'clock on Passover to, to fulfill the, because he said he came to fulfill it all. And he had to be crucified at 3 o'clock on Passover. So he had the feast of Passover the night before. They prepared it early for him. And then at Passover, he ate the Passover, but then he instituted the new, the new testament at that meal. And that's when Judas dipped into that sop, they call it, and then got up and walked out because Judas did not partake 
of the communion. Judas did not partake of the meal of the New Testament, but he did partake of the Passover, and there was a reason for that. <clears throat> we'll talk about that later. So leaven is a symbol of sin. Passover was the memorial of God's deliverance, and that night they would examine themselves. It kind of makes you think of communion, doesn't it? Because that's, that's what it speaks of to the Christian. The time of self-examination, the time of repentance, and putting away of sin. And that was the very night that Jesus, Jesus was buried. The unleavened bread. The Hebrew is lethem oni. I, I can't speak Hebrew, but I can write it. It means the bread of humiliation. Now I want you to really think about this tonight. When it's, when it's speaking of Christ, everything in it is speaking of Christ. That's why I wanted to give you these notes. All of it speaks of him. The uh, unleavened bread means the bread of humiliation. It does not mean a time to punish oneself. And this is how the people did. They started taking these feast days as more of a tradition and a ritual. And many of them would literally beat themselves. Or they would, they would fast extreme ways. <clears throat> and if you really think about that, what is that? That's trying to reach God your own way. That's works. That's works. And he didn't want that. That's not what this was about. Not at all. He said the unleavened bread meant the bread of humiliation. It meant to look inside and see what you really were. And that you need God. It's an inner examination. Okay? And that's what the unleavened bread was all about. It, would, it meant the bread of humiliation. It does not mean a time to punish oneself or afflicting oneself, which denotes, as I said, works or self-righteousness. Number five, it means a time to let go of the ego, that pride. You know, my one friend calls that edging God out. I thought that was pretty good. It's an inner examination. You have to let go of that ego, let go of that pride, which hinders us. From seeing ourselves as the sinners we really are. That's what it was all about. Seeing ourselves for what we really are. And when you take the Lord's Supper, that's what you're supposed to do. There's a time of self-examination before you take that unleavened bread. Because that bread speaks of his body being broken for us, as we'll see. So it means a time to let go of the e ego, the pride. It means a time, the Bible speaks about laying aside the weight that does so easily hinder us or beset us. We need that self-judgment, that time to set aside. So it means a time, in, in, in ancient times, when Jews made bread. And I thought this was really interesting for people who study these things. In ancient times, when Jews made bread, they always added a little lump of the bread they'd made the day before. Okay? <laughs> Even though it, it, it was rotten. <laughs> okay? That little lump. In ancient times when Jews made bread, they always added a little lump or a pinch, they called it. They loved, loved to say a pinch. <laughs> a pinch of sour dough from the last batch. Now, unleavened means without sin, and you're adding a little pinch from the left. What are you doing? Yeah, you're adding the sin. That's right. So listen to what it says. So in ancient times when Jews made bread, they always added a little lump or a pinch of sourdough from the last batch of the day before. So that way the sin was passed on from day to day to day, just like from Adam to the next one to the next one to the next one. That little pinch, that little pinch of sourdough. Galatians 5, 9 says, a little leaven, leaveneth the whole lump. Okay? A little leaven, leaveneth the whole lump. In 1 Corinthians 5, 6 and 7, it says, your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven, leaveneth the whole lump? See, he was teaching them using something they would understand. Because they would take that little leaven that would puff up that would corrupt, that would cause corruption. They'd take that little leaven and they'd put it in the dough. So a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump, speaking of the sin. He says, purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened without sin. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. So we were to be a new lump, a new lump of flour. <laughs> 
was used. One without leaven or sin, and it was beaten, and it was striped, and it was pierced. I remember I used to make bread a lot for when we would have communion. And I would cry. <laughs> the tears would be in that bread. I would just cry because you'd have to take just the flour. Yeah, I know you ate it. You'd take the flour and the water and you'd pound it and pound it and pound it and pound it and pound it. And then you have to take a fork and you just stripe it and stripe it and stripe it and stripe it. And then you have to pierce it. And see, that bread is the bread from heaven. It represents the bread from heaven, what Jesus went through for us. And then after it's pierced, then you put it in the fire. See, that's a picture of Jesus on the cross. Remember I read last week how he didn't even appear as a man. He was so beaten, his stripes, and he was pierced, and it was so bad that he didn't even look like a human anymore. You just take that bread and you beat it and beat it. He was teaching them all the way back then. All the way back then he was showing them he was the Passover lamb. He was the bread. And that he would be striped and he would be pierced and he would be put in the fire. But it was to get rid of the leaven. It had to be an unleavened bread. But see, we all have leaven. Jesus didn't. We all have that little piece of lump from Adam. Jesus didn't. <laughs> He was a new lump without sin. And that's what God demanded, was that new lump of flour. So a new lump of flour was used, one without leaven or sin. It was beaten, it was striped, and then pierced, and then put in the fire. Isaiah 53, 4 says, Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Now notice this is the Old Testament. Okay? Carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Can you imagine, I can't help but say this again, when a Jew finally sees, wow, he was the Messiah. And you use Isaiah 53 when you're dealing with Jews. They go, wow, he, he is the Messiah. What an awakening that must be to realize all the things that they did was speaking of a Jesus that had been rejected when he came. The light would just go on. And can you imagine Paul, and I always do, but you know when Paul got saved, he went out into the Arabian desert for three years. You know where he went? Mount Sinai. You know why? To be taught of God. So when he came back, he was on fire and ready to go. Sometimes the backside of the desert is the best place to be. Because that's the time when you are completely leaning wholly upon God. Have you ever been on the backside of the desert? I think we all have. And so Paul went on the, and he went, where did he go? Mount Sinai. The mountain of God. And he was there for three years being taught of God, that what all this was. <laughs> Can you see him sitting there? Well, Paul, let's talk about Passover. <laughs> well, Paul, let's talk about the unleavened bread. I mean, he was being taught of God. And when he came back, he was a special apostle to the Gentiles. A special apostle to the Gentiles, because the first church was Jewish. Those 3,000 souls that were saved on Pentecost, they were Jewish. Jewish people forget that while well, they're taught that they were Gentiles. They were not Gentiles, they were Jews. <laughs> Peter didn't open the door to the Gentiles until Acts chapter 10. All those who were saved were Jews. And they just got comfortable. And a lot of them wanted their rituals and their laws and the grace. And that's what we see the, the arguing back and forth and back and forth in the New Testament. And Paul telling them, no, no, you can't return to that. He fulfilled all that. He fulfilled it all. And you see that all the way through the epistles. So Paul went on the backside of the desert and God taught him. And he came back as the special apostle to the Jews. All right, let's go on. Consider. Now consider this. You've got to put your thinking hats on. I know it's hard to do this time of night because everybody's starting to get a little tired. But just think about this. 
The natural process of death is what? Decay. Corruption. Now think about that for a minute. That lump. That lump of leaven would decay. It would corrupt. Okay? It, it speaks of sin. And there would be no death where, that brings corruption if there hadn't been sin. It all goes back to the same thing. Sin. Sin is what brought death. And death is what brought corruption. So consider the natural process of death is decay. It's the curse of death, death that is corruption. But the Bible says that he, not, he did not see any corruption. Why? There was no sin in him. <laughs> There was no sin in him. And I thought it was interesting, too, that the very word stripes and friend come from the same root word. Get your strongs and look that up. The very word for stripes and friends, because there's no greater friend than Jesus. He had laid down his life. Consider this. <clears throat> Now, let me read it again. The natural process of death is decay. The curse of death is corruption. There would have never been death without sin. The old Jews thought of leaven as yet Sarah, that which causes evil impulses. Now that is true. <laughs> they thought that the, the leaven is what caused the evil impulses within. I can't imagine all the things that they did that represented Christ right there. And yet, they couldn't see it. They had a veil and just could not see it. They just would not see it. Okay? So therefore, the unleavened bread to them represented the bread or the body of being pure and free from any corruption that might cause evil impulses. <laughs> so this was passed down from Father, that should be Adam, who was the old lump. Think of Adam as the old lump. <laughs> right down to each child. Okay? Because sin was passed down. From Adam to child, from father to son, from father to son, from father to son. Now when the second Adam, and that speaks of Jesus Christ, the last Adam come, listen what it says. And so it is written, the first Adam was made a living soul. The last Adam, that's Jesus Christ, was made a quickening spirit. And then 1 Corinthians 15, 47 says, the first man, that's Adam, is of the earth, earthly. The second man is the Lord from heaven. So the second Adam, Adam Hashini, is that's Jesus Christ. And Hebrews 9.26 says, For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once, in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. He fulfilled it all. Now listen, here's a few more things. It's so neat. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, which means what? House of bread. So whenever we think of this unleavened bread, what we need to think about is Jesus Christ. So after Calvary, at 3 o'clock on the 14th, at 6 o'clock that very day began the 15th of the unleavened bread, the putting away of sin. Jesus was being buried. The Egyptians were burying the firstborn. See how it all fits? It's one perfect pattern. One perfect pattern. So it, the unleavened bread speaks of his burial, and it speaks of separation. It speaks of being set aside for the Lord. It speaks of self-examination. It speaks of the Lord's Supper. It speaks of the time before we take the Lord's Supper. He said, that time, take a, take a few minutes and examine yourself. And make sure everything is right with God before you take that bread. You don't take that bread unworthily. Look what it says. So he was, he was born in Bethlehem, which means the house of bread. In John 6, 51, he said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat this bread, because <laughs> he was reminding them of the bread that fell from heaven during the time of Moses. Okay? And he said, but I'm the living bread. That bread represented him. That bread that was coming down from heaven represented Jesus Christ. And it was not to be wasted. That's why the lamb had to be eaten. And what wasn't eaten had to be burned up because he was not to see any corruption. It all spoke of Jesus. 
So he was the bread that came down from heaven. He said, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. And then Luke 22, 19 says, And he took the bread, and he gave thanks, and he broke it and gave it unto them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, do you think, as he was speaking to them, that they were remembering what they always did at Passover? How they would put the leaven out of the house? And how, how they would even take the bread. They had a matzah tosh bag. And it avakomen bag. And it had three compartments like this. And they represented the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Okay? And the middle bag, they would take the bread out of it and they would break it. That spoke of his body being broke. Now imagine these Jews doing this all these years, taking the bread, and they do it even now, and they break that bread, that body, they break it all up, and then they wrap it in linen. <laughs> they wrap it in linen, and then they hide it somewhere where it won't be seen. Sometimes they even bury it. They hide it where it won't be seen. And then they bring it out later when they have the cups. But not until the third cup, as we'll get to in a minute. I mean, they would hide that bread. And you know what that meant, Afikonin? It means he's coming again. He's coming again. It means he comes. And it speaks of his body being broken and then buried and then rising again. Rising again. So here they did that over and over and over again. And remember the feather with the leaven and getting it out of the house. All these things were pictures of Jesus Christ. All of them. But yet, when he came, they rejected him. They rejected him. Well, how many people, just even Christians, do not want him to come right now? <laughs> how many? It's hard to say. So he is the bread of life. He, he was born in Bethlehem. And he says in John 12, 24, Very, very, I say unto you, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. And I thought as I was reading that, wow, you know, Bethlehem means house of bread. And Naz Nazareth means the branch. And when he speaks about himself, he speaks about him being a corn of wheat that falls into the ground and brings forth life. And you think about that. Those of you who sat with me in the studies about the stars, the first constellation, Virgo, which speaks of the virgin birth. In one star, there is a star that means the corn of wheat. <coughs> And another star is what? What's in that hand? A branch. And that whole constellation, the names of the stars that God named, God named those stars, right. and he placed them where he wanted them. And that's where you start in the circle around the sun to tell the story with a virgin birth all the way around the, the, the battle and the dragon and all the way around until the coming of the lion to set up the kingdom. That was God's message and still is God's message, but Satan corrupted it because he did not want man to know, just like he corrupted all of these things and did not want man to know. They were blindly doing things and didn't even understand what they were doing. They were blinded by who? The God of this age. And that first constellation spoke of a, a virgin. Virgo, speaking of a virgin who was holding, the, the star would be where her hand would be if there was a picture, and in one hand was the branch. And Jesus has spoken of as the branch all the way through the Old Testament. <laughs> and the branch means Nazareth, and they called him the Nazarene. And you know that's what they're, they're putting an end on the doors of the Christians in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're putting an end on the doors of the Christians in the Middle East. These very nations that we are applauding right now hate 
Christians right. and persecute them all the time. All the time. In Saudi Arabia, they do not allow a church. No churches in Saudi Arabia. Is the witness there? Yes. And they mm -hmm. found 29 of them a couple weeks ago and arrested them and haven't heard what's happened to them since. Mm -hmm. And they're applauding them. And they're killing Christians. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they're applauding them. And they want to kill the Jews. It just blows my mind. But here the Jews had all of this. They had the bread. They had the, the bag that said he comes. And they do this year after year after year. They still do it. But what always amazes me are the Jews who finally get saved and go, Whoa! I know what that means. Because see, the Jews did not know what the three compartments was. They didn't understand it was God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. They did not understand. In fact, they sing the song all the time. My God is one. Mm. But in the Hebrew, that word for one is plural. <laughs> and they just did not get it. Why? They're blinded. And that's what's wrong with the world today. They're mm -hmm. blinded. Mm -hmm. They're blinded. They're not looking at things through the word. See, when I look at these things, I look at it from a biblical perspective. I don't care what they say on CNN. I don't care what they say on any of the news. I don't care what the president says. And many multitudes of the preachers who are standing up today and saying the wrong things. I care what this book says. And I'm going to continue to look at the world through a biblical perspective, and I hope you do too. I hope you're not deceived. The Jews were deceived. The Jews were blinded. And they had it in their face in every feast day. It all spoke of Jesus. Every feast day spoke of him. So he is the branch. He is the branch of Jehovah. And he is the one that would fall into the ground and die. It's, you know, the seed, when you plant that seed in the earth, it dies and then it brings forth new life. It brings forth new life. He always used things that they would understand. Just like breaking that bread. Breaking the body of Christ. Look at your next page. It would be a memorial. It's an identification. I mean, we were supposed to partake of the Lord's Supper. There's only two ordinances in the church. Only two. That was given by God. Believer's baptism. You won't find the baby baptism anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. And then the Lord's Supper. That's the only two. There's lots of churches who have six or seven or whatever, but God only gave two. Anything else was added by man. Okay? Anything else. And this unleavened bread that we partake, he said, as often as you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. That unleavened bread. <coughs> Chew that up. I mean, I know some places where they, they actually make sandwiches. They actually buy cookies. Because they said the bread don't taste good. You know? And they don't use the leavened, unleavened bread. They're making a mockery of it. Mm -hmm. You know, it just becomes another thing that they do. And when you take the Lord's Supper, and only Christians should take the Lord's Supper. Only Christians should take the Lord's Supper. And even before you do, you examine yourself before you put that piece of unleavened bread in your mouth that's pierced and striped and broken as you chew it up. It speaks of his body that was given for you. And they do that year after year after year and are expecting him to come <laughs> not realizing he already has but he is coming again he is coming again so it's to be a memorial an identification with the suffering and the afflictions of Jesus Christ on our behalf that's what we need to think about what that is it's a memorial it's identifying with him that yes you died for me and I died with you you were buried for me, and I was buried with you. You rose again, and I rose with you. Because why? I'm in you, and you're in me. It's an identification. It's what baptism is all about. 
And the afflictions, we're supposed to think of the afflictions of Jesus Christ. And you see people when they have communion just laughing and carrying on and not even paying attention to what they're doing. And then we look at the Jews and we think, how foolish of them to go through all those rituals and not see Jesus in it. Well, how foolish of us to take communion and not see Jesus in it. Communion was set up on Passover. It was set up on Passover. They had Passover dinner, and then Judas left, and then he instituted the New Testament with the Lord's Supper. And we see these pictures of Jesus sitting around on a table and loaves of bread and all that stuff in front of him. That is not true. It is not true. It was unleavened bread on the table. Unleavened bread on the table. And it wasn't one cup that they passed around. There were four cups. And the fourth one he didn't partake of. He said, I won't eat or drink mm -hmm. again until I come and get you and you're with me. That fourth cup, they didn't drink of, but there were four cups, as we'll see here in Exodus in just a minute. So it was the memorial, it was identification with his suffering and the afflictions that Jesus would go through on our behalf, that we died with him and receive him as our full payment. It's just like applying the blood on the door. Killing the lamb wouldn't be enough. If the blood isn't applied, you know, believing in God is not enough. Believing in Jesus Christ is not enough. If the blood isn't applied, if you don't take it personal, intimate, inside, then you're not saved. Because <laughs> you're to have an intimate, personal relationship with Him. Not just religion, an intimate, personal. You can see why I said this is holy ground. It's hard to even walk on it when you think of this. But this is the difference between religion and going to hell and a relationship and going to heaven. <laughs> because so many things have become rituals that it's a stench in His nose. He said, For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body. They break that bread and they hide it. And they eat unleavened bread and a few other things we'll talk about here in a minute. That the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he break it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. It did not become his flesh. It did not become blood. That too was added by man. And it can only be done by special men who were wearing special clothes and said special words. In, in the book of Revelation, we would call them Nicolaitans. Okay? After the same manner also he took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as oft as ye drink it in remembrance of me. So the unleavened bread is a picture of our communion with him. We died with him, we were buried with him. See the picture? It is our communion with him. It's, it's our identification with him. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this, drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and of the blood of Jesus. But let a man examine himself. And that's what unleavened bread was. They were supposed to put on their shoes. They were to put on their coat. They were to have staff in hand. They were to be under the blood. They were to eat the unleavened bread and the other things that spoke of his death and his, his suffering. They were to do all that examining themselves and stay there as he hovered over the house and protected them from the death of the firstborn. Because we're all firstborn. That principle is taught all the way through the Bible. We're the firstborn, but then when we get saved, we're the secondborn. The firstborn has the curse of death upon them. The secondborn, the curse has been removed because what Jesus did, he died for us. So it's the secondborn that receives the inheritance. It's the secondborn 
that has the eternal joys with the Lord, the second Lord. And those who die lost, they go straight to hell. I mean, that's a fact. He said, let every man examine himself, so let him, uh, so, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. And this is why Christians keep this feast. It tells us at that time that we're to purge out, therefore, the old leaven. Confess our sins unto the Lord. And we should be confessing our sins unto the Lord daily. I know Christians who think they don't have to confess their sins anymore because Jesus didn't just die for the sins that they committed before he got saved, that, they died for, that he died for all the sins, and that is true. He did. He did die for all the sins. Even the sins you'll commit tomorrow or the next day, he already paid the penalty for that sin. But sinning and not confessing and repenting breaks fellowship with him. It breaks that communion with him. Not the relationship. And this is where we part a lot of times. People part with us. It's because you can't break that relationship. Once you're saved, you're always saved. Once you're born into his family, he never throws you out of his family. He, he said, I will never forsake you. I will never cast you out. No matter what you do. <laughs> but the thing is this. If you do and don't confess it and don't repent of it, then he starts chastening you to bring you back on the right path. That's what he does. So it's a relationship. You can't, you can't lose the relationship. You're born into his family. But you can lose fellowship. You can lose that communion with him. That you can lose. So the confession needs to be, and that's what we see in the, in the tabernacle, in the laver. That confession should be every day. Every day. I even at night before I go to bed. Pray, Lord, if there's anything that I've done today that I have that I've forgotten, bring it to my mind. Now, am I worried that if I died during the night I wouldn't go to heaven? No. I just don't want that fellowship. I don't want that communion broken with my Father. I want to keep that straight line <laughs> of communication. I want to keep that open. I want to keep that open. And the very fact that you even consider that is proof that you're saved. Right. Is proof that you're saved. So he says, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore let us keep the feast. Now look, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. <laughs> People say, oh, well, we need to practice this. We need to do these Passovers. Churches all over the country are doing these. He said, no. No. It's in here now. Spirit and truth. We need to examine ourselves and cast out those things that are that is not pleasing to God. Separate ourselves. That feast of unleavened bread means being separated. It means putting sin away. It means to be to be sanctified, set apart for him. That's what that means. I mean, it's a very holy thing. Very holy thing. And we take it so lightly. We take the Passover, not us, but people take it so lightly. The Passover being that lamb. And that being Jesus Christ. And the unleavened bread. Him being buried. Him being buried. And remember where we said he went? His body went in the tomb. But Jesus went into paradise in the center of the earth. That's where he went. To shout what? It is finished. It is finished. And then when he came out, what happened? Mary wanted to touch him. He said, don't touch me yet. I've got to go into heaven and take my blood. But people said, oh no, the dogs licked up the blood. Somehow, God miraculously had that blood. And Jesus took that blood into heaven, the literal blood, into heaven, the literal heaven, into the Holy of Holies, the literal Holy of Holies, and poured that blood on the judgment seat, and it became a mercy seat. A mercy seat. Why? Because he said, I have come to fulfill it all. So he had to do that. And if she had touched him, 
It would have defiled him and had been for naught. So they killed him on the 14th. They had the unleavened bread on the 15th. It started at 6 p.m. that night. They left Egypt. They stood by the waters of the Red Sea. <laughs> they crossed the Red Sea and were on the other side on the 17th. Now, I want you to look at that for a minute. 14th, he was crucified. 14th, Passover. 15, what 14 means what? Salvation. 15 means what? Rest. 16 means what? Love. 17 means victory. <laughs> The ark rested after the flood on the 17th. Wherever you find the 17th in the Bible, it's speaking of great victory. Great victory. So they, they crossed the Red Sea, which is a picture of the death and the burial. And then coming up on the other side, the victory. And that's when they were singing and praising the Lord. Why? Because the enemy, the very thing that saved them, destroyed the enemy. Pharaoh and his horses all went into after them. And then the Lord told Moses, hold out. And he held out that rod and the waters closed in on them. Closed in on them. Satan, we're going to see Satan destroyed one of these days. But that's a picture of the death and the, path and the burial and the resurrection, the salvation in the blood. So we see that these are very, very important not, um, not only just important to the Jews, but important to the Christian. And the spring feasts are all fulfilled. The fall feasts begin tonight. <coughs> That's really something to think about. The fall feasts begin tonight. The Feast of Trumpets, then the Feast of Atonement, and then the Feast of Tabernacles. But here we have his death, his burial, and his resurrection in the first fruits. Let's go on. Once they finally entered the promised land, like I told you before, they were to make their sacrifices in one place. And even that, you see Christ in that. Because here's the temple mount on Mount Moriah, the very place where Abraham took Isaac to offer him. And then right on the other side of the ridge is what? To the north, Calvary. Calvary. Think of that. Even, even those things picture Jesus Christ. It all speaks of him, every bit of it. Why people do not want to study the Old Testament, even the feast days. A lot of people just can't get the feast days. They say, oh, that's just boring. Well, I just can't see it being boring. I just really can't. And I know I had someone tell me the other day, well, just because you're interested in it doesn't mean other people are. <laughs> so, okay. But the truth is, as a Christian... Once you get the picture of this, it should feed your soul. It should really feed your soul. So once they finally entered the promised land of Israel, they were to make their sacrifices in one place. They cannot, they could not have sacrifices. After 70 AD, when Rome came in and took down their temple, they have not had a place to have a sacrifice since. Since 70 AD. You can imagine why the Jews were so happy when they became a nation again. And now they're prepared to build that temple. And the Antichrist is going to let them have their temple. The Antichrist is going to let them have their blood sacrifices. The Antichrist is going to let them have their feast days for three and a half years. They're just going to think, wow, this is just so great. It's all here. They're going to tear down the walls that they've built. And they think they're at peace. And then he comes in and sets himself up as God and takes away all of that. All of that. And they want it so very badly. Jerusalem itself. Originally, the Old Testament name was Salem, meaning the place of peace. And he is the prince of peace. In Deuteronomy 12, 11, look what it says. Then there shall be a place which the Lord your God shall choose to cause his name to dwell there. That's Jerusalem. <laughs> and the Temple Mount. And who bought that ground? Anybody remember? David. It was a threshing. It was a threshing floor where wheat was threshed. And they used the tribular, speaking of the tribulation, to thresh the wheat. I mean, every bit of it is a picture of Christ. On that temple mount, it was a threshing floor. And David bought it. God chose it. That's where I want my temple. 
That's where on Mount Moriah. God shall choose to cause his name to dwell there. Thither shall you bring all that I command you, your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, your tithes, the heave offering of your hand, and all your choice vows, which ye vow unto the Lord. That, that was the only place, and still is the only place. And ye shall rejoice before the Lord your God, ye and your sons and your daughters, and your men servants and your maid servants, and the Levite that is within your gates, for as much as he hath no part nor inheritance with you. Because the land was divided into in 13 parts. As you study in the Old Testament. 13 parts because one part belonged to the Lord and to the Levites who served the Lord. Okay? That's a study within itself. Take heed to thyself that thou offer not the burnt offerings in every place that thou seest. It can only be offered in one place. But in the place which the Lord shall choose in one of thy tribes, there thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings, and there thou shalt do all that I command thee. Only one place, and that is the temple mount, where the dome of the rock sits to this very day. Okay? So they can't have Passover, and they, have, they celebrate Passover. And they use many of these same things every year. But they cannot have their sacrifice because they do not have their temple. So the shank bone stands for the lamb that would be slain, put on that pit and put in a fire and slain. So that's what that is. Okay, look at your page 23. And that's just 14 points that I didn't want us to miss because they're so rich as we study this. The Passover, they began preparing, like we said, for unleavened bread seven days before. And began the feast on the 15th, which begins at 6 p.m. Numbers 33, verse 3 and 4. In the box, we're going to read these scriptures. And they departed from Ramses in the first month, that'd be September, on the 15th day of the first month, that would be unleavened bread. So people say, when did they depart? They departed on the 15th. <laughs> The Feast of Unleavened Bread. It started at 6 o'clock on the 14th and lasted till 6 o'clock the next day. Okay. The children of Israel went out with a high hand in the sight of all the Egyptians, for the Egyptians buried all their firstborn. The world was burying all their firstborn, which the Lord had smitten among them. Upon their gods also the Lord executed judgments. They were never to forget, even to this day, they were never to forget their deliverance from Egypt and celebrated the teaching of their children. They would never forget that. They would ask the questions. The youngest would sit next to the father, even to this day, and they would ask him, why are we doing this? Why are we eating this? <laughs> and he knew, but he was to ask it so the father could teach them. Right. He could teach them, and he was supposed to teach them over and over and over and over again, year after year after year. Every year taking those four cups, every year taking that bag and breaking that bread and hiding it in linen. Every day offering the first fruits with a red ribbon tied on it or a scarlet ribbon. Every, they did it over and over and over again. The leaven, the symbol of sin, the unleavened bread, no sin, because he was without sin. And that's what it speaks of. And that's what we need to remember when we take communion. So it means something to the Jew. It has a literal meaning. It has a personal meaning. It has a prophetic meaning. That's how rich God's word is. It has all these different meanings. And you could just, I mean, you could spend weeks and weeks and weeks on one feast. Just on one feast because it speaks of Jesus Christ and something he did or something he's going to do. Okay, So he was the bread from heaven. Jesus was pleading with the Jews when he was here upon the earth, pleading with them, hoping that they would understand what the unleavened bread was. Pleading with them, and Paul pled with them. But no, they had become legalistic. They had become, it had become a ritual instead of that intimate, personal relationship 
Okay? So Jesus was pleading with them, trying to get them to understand the meaning of the unleavened bread. Look at these verses in Matthew 16, 11. It's in red in the center of your page. How is it, this is Jesus talking, how is it that ye do not understand that I spake it not to you concerning bread? That's got anything to do with the bread, okay? <laughs> Look what he's saying. That you should beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, the religious crowd. And what was the leaven? The hypocrisy, the sin. This is what he's talking to them about. Then understood they how that he bade them not to beware of the leaven of the bread, but of the doctrine, the false doctrines, everything that was added to. The false doctrine of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees, the religious crowd. In Mark 8, 15, he said, and he charged them, saying, Take heed, beware of that leaven. I mean, look what all has been added to and taken away from the very simple things that he gave us. The hierarchy that was built. When there were only to be two offices, the pastor, who was called the chief elder or the shepherd, and then the deacons or the elders, whatever you wanted to call them. And what were they to do? The pastor, the shepherd, he was to study and pray and minister to the people. And the others were to be servants, to take care of the widows and the orphans and be apt to teach and, and, and make it easier for the pastor or the shepherd to feed the sheep. But usually the pastor is so busy doing so many things, there's no time to study and feed the sheep. Then a lot of times there are pastors who are there just for the money. Or just for the position. And God calls them hireling prophets. Because you see how important it was to feed the sheep. That way they wouldn't be deceived. They wouldn't fall into these traps if they knew what they meant. He said, it's the leaven. The leaven of the Pharisees that I'm talking to you about. The wicked government. And most of their religious leaders were also their political leaders. So he spoke of them, of the leaven of Herod. So the Feast of the Lord had become religious rituals by the time Jesus was walking the earth. And he celebrated these feasts. And we find him in John, at each one of them, at Passover and the unleavened bread. He celebrated these feasts with them in the book of John. Even the Feast of Tabernacles, which is my favorite. And he said, these were all rehearsals. These were rehearsals of what I'm going to come and do. He said, I came and I died. I came and I rose again. He said, on the first fruits, he rose again. He was to be the first fruits. We find that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He had to be the first fruits. And what was the first fruits? It was a promise. Here's the first fruits, and, and it would be waved before the priest, and it was a promise that more was to come. Why? Because he is the green that had fallen into the ground and died to bring forth life. So he is the first fruits that they would see. They would go out in the field and they'd see that first fruits and they would tie it, take a bundle of it and they'd tie it with a scarlet tie and then they'd take it into the temple and wave it before God. And then Corinthians tells us he is that first fruit. He is the first fruit of harvest. You know, harvest has three parts. It has the first fruit and then it has the harvest and then it has the gleanings. The first fruit was Jesus, and then those who rose again after he rose. The harvest is the rapture. And then the gleanings are those who will be saved during the tribulation and the kingdom. There were three parts. In fact, these feast days were all based upon harvest. Harvest times. It was all speaking of harvest. And what is the Great Commission? That we're to go out and bring in the sheaves. We're to go out and bring the sheaves in. The Great Commission. The people are failing with the Great Commission. They're doing church. They're doing worship. What they consider worship. But are they doing the Great Commission? Because that is what we're here for. <laughs> to reach the fruit that's in the field. That song, my house is full, but my fields are empty. I don't know if you've ever heard that song. That song touched my heart. Every time I hear that song, I cry. And he said, 
My house is full. The whole field, it's empty. Who will go and serve in my field? We, we're losing that of what that really is. But we're doing church. We're doing worship. We're doing all kinds of social things. But are we doing the Great Commission? And are we learning His Word that we can share it? The Bible says that we are to know His Word and be prepared with an answer. Do you know what takes up study time? Television. Activities. You know, people are so busy that they don't have time to actually sit down and study God's Word. Or read it. They just have too many other things going. And God knows that. God knows that. Leviticus 23, 5 and 6. In the 14th day of the first month, at evening is the Lord's Passover. On the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread unto the Lord. Seven days you eat unleavened bread. Seven days. And then we said, 1 Corinthians, we've already read that. Look at your next page. Traditionally, as we said, they take this matzah tosh bag, the athokimen, with three compartments, and they slide a piece of bread in each compartment, not knowing what it even meant. <laughs> they didn't even know what it meant. They came up with all different kinds of things. Maybe it meant, maybe it meant first fruits and harvest and gleanings, and maybe it meant the high priest and and the Levites and and the people. I mean, they keep coming up with all these different. Like maybe it means this, and maybe it means that. And God said it meant he comes and that he's the bread, the bread from heaven. But they kept coming up with all different things that that could mean. Listen, they take the middle piece of unleavened bread, they break it, they wrap it in linen. What does linen mean? Righteousness. They hide it, that speaks of the burial, till they come to the third cup. So that means there are three cups. But actually, there are four cups. Four cups. The Passover meal leads right into the Feast of Unleavened Bread, just as death led to the burial. And just as when we get saved, should lead to being separated unto God from the sin of the world. Okay, to put it away, put it away out of our life. Jesus Christ was the last, last Passover meal led, and led to his death on Passover and the burial and then his resurrection on the first fruits. It's just one step after another. Death, burial, first fruits, resurrection. I want you to memorize this. Because then from then on, every time you read about Jesus celebrating Passover or, or the Jews going in for first fruits, you realize, wait a minute. They're celebrating the resurrection of Christ and don't even know it. That he is the first fruit. He is the first fruits. Okay? He established the Lord's Supper on the very night. He wanted to have Passover with them. And he said, go. He said, I desire to have Passover with you before I die. So they had to pass over the day before, the night before. Just before he was arrested, they had Passover. But before he left the upper room, he instituted the Lord's Supper. The new, the new testament that would be based upon his blood. But here's the thing, the old testament was based upon blood too. Because without blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. And the blood sacrifices in the Old Testament spoke of his coming in the New Testament. But the blood sacrifices in the Old Testament covered the sins, and that's why they went into paradise in the center of the earth until he came, took his blood into heaven, and then raised them out of paradise into heaven. Why? Because their, blood, their sin now was taken away, not just covered. Not just covered. And he instituted this New Testament. And can you imagine how, you know, the Bible says that they really, there was many of them did not even believe until he rose from the dead. But he told them, you will understand. You will understand in about three days. <laughs> in about three days. Even when he talked to, to them about destroying the temple and in three days, I'll restore this. He's, he thinks he can tear down this 
temple and build it back in three days. I like seeing dry. It took us 49 years to build that thing. <laughs> blinded, blinded, blinded. All the things they've been doing all that time. And they were blinded when he came to fulfill it. And here's the thing. They were looking for him to come. They were looking for him. Every time they did a sacrifice, it was supposed to be preparing for him to come. That's what it was all about. That's why I say how amazing it must be, how transforming it must be for a Jew who was raised in that family to, to find Christ and to know Christ and realize what they had been doing all those many years, family before, family before. And then when they go and try and tell some of their family, guess what? They're put out of the family. As though they're dead. Some Orthodox Jews actually have funerals for children who get saved. Because they're still expecting the Messiah to come. They expected Messiah ben Joseph and Isaiah. They expected Messiah ben Joseph. They expected him to come and suffer. And then they expected Messiah ben David to come and set up the kingdom. And that's why the disciples asked him, Are you going to set up the kingdom now? <laughs> Are you? And think about this. He'd been discipling them for almost, well, for three years. Three and a half years. Remember when he asked them, do you know who I am? <laughs> well, some say you're Isaiah, some say you're Jeremiah, but who do you say I am? And Peter told him that he was the son of the living God. He was, he was, he was God, the son. <laughs> and what did Jesus say? The Father in heaven has revealed that unto you. But then even Peter rejected him three times before the cock broke, just like Jesus told him he would. Why he knows, he knows that we are dust. Mm -hmm. He knows the spirit can be willing and the flesh is weak. He knows that. He knows that. And he loves us still. <laughs> it's hard to imagine. And he loves us still. Look in the box here on the side. It says, Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto man. Now he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? Remember, it teaches us in Luke, in fact, he taught us in Luke, that in the center of the earth was hell. And we talked about that Sunday, the different hells, and how the Bible speaks of, of there being three hells. The hell in the center of the earth, the, the lake of fire, which is hell, and then Tardis, which is the pit where the fallen angels are. And it uses the same word hell in English, but it's a different word in Greek, and it's a different word in Hebrew. So the only way you will know which hell he's talking about when you read the scripture is to know which word is being used, the Hebrew word in the Old Testament, or the Greek word in the New Testament, because 31 times in the Bible it uses the word hell and it's speaking of the grave, which is a different word altogether. That's why we need to study God's word, and that's why so many things are taken out of context, and people are so confused because they forget that when it says hell, sometimes it's not meaning the lake of fire, because by the way, there's nobody in the lake of fire. That, lake, that place is empty right now. But in the center of the earth, according to Luke 16, there is a hell where people are suffering and screaming and yelling and remembering all the times that they turned down Jesus and wanting a drop of water on their tongue. And they're in darkness and flames and, and with bad company. And then there, there was a great gulf. And then on the other side was paradise, because when Lazarus died, he was carried by the angels into paradise, Abraham's bosom, a place of peace and joy, a paradise, a place of comfort. But then when, and they had to stay there until Jesus died, as I said before, and then took his blood. And then in Ephesians says, and then he led captivity free. Why? Because he had the keys of death and hell. He had victory over the grave. <laughs> He had victory over the grave. And see, some churches say, oh, well, that means that Jesus went to hell and he fought his way out through the flames and the demons. By the way, the demons aren't in hell. They're out here on the street. Amen. Okay? 
They're not in hell. They're free with Satan to roam about the world. See, that's why we need to study God's word and know which hell he was talking about. And then it tells us in Isaiah, I mean, after he moves paradise into the third heaven, because there's three heavens, God does everything in patterns. After Paul said he went into the third heaven where paradise was, because Jesus had led captivity free and took them into the very presence of God. So now when you die as a Christian, you go directly into heaven. You don't go to the center of the earth. And then Isaiah says that hell has enlarged itself. And hell wouldn't even created for man. It was created for the devil and his angels, but God knew man would follow and reject him. So it says here that he descended the same also, and he, he ascended far above all heavens that he might fill all things. He was fulfilling all the Old Testament. I mean, as we go through the rest of these feast days, and I hope you don't get discouraged, I hope you keep coming, because when we go through the rest of these feast days and you get this full picture, it's wow, you never be the same again. I know what it did in my heart. Whoa. I mean, it was just so awesome to see that. Just like studying the tabernacle. Well, when I saw that was Jesus, it wasn't just a building. That was Jesus. I mean, when God came down and went in this room back here, the board shook. The curtains raised up and down. Can you imagine the Levites who were close to it could actually hear the breath of God as it entered? That's awesome. That's awesome. And they carried that around for 40 years, then used it for 500 years before they built the temple. And Jesus came and fulfilled it all, and they were veiled. Why? Because they got so caught up in their denomination that they didn't even care if they were taught stuff that wasn't true. Mm. They were so caught up in their tradition he said, you have replaced the scriptures with the traditions of men. I mean, that's what he said. And he said, in the last days, you're going to have all these false teachers who are teaching you things that makes you feel good, and you're missing all of this. I can't tell you how many times, and I've been teaching for over 40 years now, and I can't tell you how many times people have come up to me and said, I never heard that before. I didn't know that's what that meant. So how long have you been in church? 60 years. Mm -hmm. well, and you can't blame it on the people either because we have the Bible. And there's such, there should be a hunger inside you for the Word of God. Now, not like a teacher. And I, you know, I've come to learn that. God has callings. And that's why I always give God the glory for anything at all that I learn and anything at all that I teach because... He called me to teach. Why? I guess because I was the foolish, most foolish thing he could find. <laughs> and he says he chooses the foolish things of the world. And, but he called me to teach. He gave me a hunger that nothing else could fill with the Word of God. And I still feel that hunger every day. I align every day of my life. It's around study. <laughs> And if I know I'm going to be interfered with during the day, I get up six hours before everybody else. <laughs> and he said, well, well, that's just so wonderful. No, he wakes me. And I said, well, I'm just going to lay here for a little while. Get up. You're not going to go back to sleep anyway. I mean, this is me talking to me. Why? Because he's woken me because he wants to teach me something. He said, well, you just must be a wonderful person. No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm not. Just like Paul said, <laughs> he was the basis of all men. Why God would call us? I'll tell you why. Because he alone gets the glory. He alone earns the glory. So when he calls a teacher, he gives them a hunger that is so real. They are so hungry and they are so thirsty. They want to know, they want to know, they want to know. But not only do they want to know, they want to share it with everybody who will stand still long enough. Sometimes you just want to chain them up. Hold on, I've got something else to tell you. 
Not everybody is given that. There's some teachers, and then there's some who are just filling a position. Just like there's some music leaders. <laughs> yeah. and I told you that story about me thinking that music leader could do a better job. Huh. Here I was sitting there in a pew judging him. This is terrible. <laughs> I just I know I could do better. I mean, I was a young Christian, full of myself. I know I could do better. The very next week, he wasn't there. And it was like God told the pastor, Pastor Perkins, <laughs> called Wilma. Me? Yeah. Okay. I got up there to lead the music and fell flat on my face. It was the most horrible sounding stuff you ever heard in your life. I was so ashamed. Even the pastor patted me on the back. It's okay, Wilma. <laughs> what was that? God telling me. I didn't call you to lead the music. Okay? I called you to teach. So you should, but every Christian, like a newborn babe, they should have a desire for the food. And as they eat the food, they gradually digest it and they want a little stronger food. And they eat that and they digest it and they want a little stronger food. And he says the strong meat is for those who exercise. Exercise what? Eating the milk. And then the stronger stuff and stronger stuff. But here's the problem that I found after 40 years of teaching. People will take in the milk and maybe a little of the stronger meat. Then they'll go, Phew. that just goes over my head. Who needs to know that anyway? And they leave and then they never know the joy of the depth. It's just like different compartments in the tabernacle. You want to be in the holy of holies, but it's a journey. It's a journey. That's why I'm always thankful for anyone who comes out who are interested in studying God's Word. That's, that's my life. Mm -hmm. That's my life. Let's go on. So he, he, he went into paradise. He led them free. So each time that they would have this meal, I do want to cover this. We only got ten minutes. Look at the bottom of your page. There would be four cups at the Passover dinner. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord. Now this is what the four cups are based on. I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. That first cup is the cup of sanctification. That would be their first drink. And it says, Come unto me, all ye that are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He called them. He set them apart. He set them apart. And the verse in Exodus is this. Wherefore, say unto the children of Israel, I am Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. There were four cups. He was setting them, setting them apart. Your mind. I'm, I'm going to take your burdens away from you. But that's not all of salvation. Okay? That's not all. There would be other steps. And we see them in, in Exodus, we also see them in the book of Ephesians. But let me finish reading Exodus. The first cup, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. He lifted their burdens. The second cup, I will rid you out of their bondage. It wasn't enough to bring them out. He had to break their chains. <laughs> okay? So that was the second cup. And that second cup is the cup of deliverance. Now remember, every, every Passover they would celebrate this. And he said, I want you to remember what I did for you. Not only did I lift your burdens and set you apart, but you're mine. He said, then I broke your chains and I delivered you from the bondage that you're in. We're set apart. We're delivered from the bondage that we were in. Okay? Each cup had a meaning. Let's finish reading this. And he said... I will redeem you with a stretched out arm. Now, what does that mean? I will redeem you with a stretched out Whoa. arm. Man. I will redeem you with a stretched out arm. That third cup is the cup of redemption. And with the cup of redemption, the third cup, they would bring out the broken bread. Hmm. Why with the third cup? Because he redeemed them. And they would go and they would find the bread that was hidden, the broken bread that was wrapped in linen. That's his body as he stretched out his arms. 
and see all of that religion that he hates and he still hates. All of that religion was torn with his body when he opened up that curtain from top to bottom. He opened it up and he said, here is the new and living way. My body is that veil. His body is. And they do this every Passover and have no idea why they do it. It's a ritual. So you can see how something so beautiful, like baptism. Baptism, believers' baptism, and it's for believers. Believers' baptism is beautiful. What is it? It's an identification. You're identifying with him. It's an outward show of an inner work. But what did Satan do? He corrupted and said, oh, that's washing away your sin. Hmm. No, it's not. The blood washes away your sin. The blood was in Passover. When they went into the Red Sea, which, by the way, was dry ground, mm -hmm. it was a picture of that death, that burial, that resurrection, a picture of baptism, the death. You're identified with him. I died with you, Jesus, and I want the whole world to know. It's a testimony. I'm identifying with you. I died with you. I rose again mm -hmm. to new life. Amen. And we saw it. Passover, unleavened bread, crossing crossing the Red Sea. The waters congealed on both sides like they were buried. And they walked across and came out on the other side with first fruits, the resurrection, on the very day, the 17th. How good does it get? The third cup is the cup of redemption. Look at your bottom of the page, the first cup of sanctification to set you apart, praise the Lord. Free from burdens. The second cup is deliverance. John 8, 36. It's the Son, therefore, shall make you free. Ye shall be free and dead. indeed. And then the third cup, the cup of redemption. The price was about to be paid on Calvary. That broken bread. In 1 Peter, it speaks about you're bought with a precious blood. Not with gold, not with silver but with the blood of the Passover lamb, the lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, the lamb without sin. And then the fourth cup. Now remember, he wouldn't drink again. He said after the, he had prepared to go for the redemption, he said, I, I won't drink. And it's, in fact, I have it here. Mark 14, 25. He said, verily I say unto you, I will drink no more of the fruit of the vine until that day that I drink it new in the kingdom. That fourth cup is that acceptance. Where he says in Ephesians 1, 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. A time to rejoice. A time when he comes and he drinks that cup. What is that cup? By the way, that is the wedding cup. <laughs> that is the wedding cup. So there are four cups. Four is what? The number of the world. He died for the sins of the world. And they did this year after year after year and had no idea why they were doing it. Why? They were blinded. They even had Moses put a veil over his face because they just could not look into the future. Why? They're too busy with their daily things. Too busy with the things of life. Too busy going here and going there and going here and watching this and watching that and listening to this and listening to that. And no time. No time. Just like the world today. Flying by. <laughs> Flying by. So the fourth cup is that fourth cup of acceptance. The table was set with parsley. On the next page. It was set with parsley, which meant, and it was dipped in, in salt water, which showed his tears. Then the bitter herbs, that was the hardship and sorrow. The shank bone, that was the sacrificial lamb of God. The apple dessert, that was the sweetness of his deliverance. Even the roasted egg represented the temple destroyed twice. Now they added things to this, as they would. <laughs> Just as man has added things to the church today. All the different sacraments and what baptism means and has just twisted it and turned it. Just twisted it and turned it. And he said, Jews, it all became a religion unto them. 
every niche. Not one bone was to be, I mean, we went over this, not one bone. He had to be the firstborn. He had to be the firstborn male. He couldn't have any sin. Not one bone could be. He had to be pierced and put on a pit and then a spit, I guess they call it, and then put in the fire. I mean, can you see the picture of Jesus? Then they had to take him in, and anything they didn't take in, they had to burn because no corruption. There couldn't be any corruption on him because he was a sinless Lamb of God. So you see how they, they, they did this year after year after year. And how important it is when we take communion and when we read about these feasts, we realize, number one, that he's already come and fulfilled all the spring feasts. Okay? Pentecost pictures the church age. They were given the law, the first Pentecost, and then the Pentecost in the book of Acts, they're given the Holy Spirit grace, the church age. Okay. So once you get these feast days down and these rituals that they went through, and once you go through this tabernacle and study what it meant, then when you get to study in your New Testament, it just opens up. I mean, the book of Revelation just opens up as you realize what he's speaking of. Because why? You have compared scripture with scripture. You know his patterns. You know his types. You know his symbols. And what was he telling the Jews? Jesus is coming. And what is he telling the church? Jesus is coming. He gave them signs. He's given us signs. And we just need to look at it from a biblical perspective. And then there won't be fear. There won't be dirt, worry, and all those things. Why? Because we know he's coming. And he's going to rescue us. Let's close in prayer.